That's what that's what, that's what, uh, that's what Sam said. But I thought they they had a consented name. I 
<laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, these lectures are hosted by Friends of Haystack Rock and the Cannon Beach Library. Um, this season of lectures is especially dedicated to Sandy Lundy, our great friend. And the lectures are always on the second Wednesday of each month. So the next one will be April. Uh, I'm sorry, March 8th, that is through April. So the second Wednesday through April and uh, March 8th will be one about transient killer whales. Um, this one, the title is starting the conversations around potential sea otter reintroduction on the Pacific coast. Sea otters have been absent from Oregon's coast since the early 1980s. The reintroduction of these marine mammals to Northern California and Oregon is currently being evaluated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This talk will cover the history of sea otters throughout their range and the ecological benefits they provide with an emphasis on next steps as we consider a potential reintroduction. Michelle St. Martin is the Marine Conservation Coordinator with the US Fish and Wildlife Service's Newport office. She has over a decade of experience working with marine mammals, including polar bears and sea otters, primarily in Alaska. She is excited to be working in Oregon and about the opportunities it brings for continued learning and collaboration. And I present to you, Michelle St. Martin. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Oh my gosh, it's a gorgeous night. I really appreciate it. And, um, yeah, so I'm fairly new to Oregon, so I feel like part of this is just me learning from you all too. Uh, and so tonight we're just gonna 
start talking about, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service recently published our feasibility study. So talking about that, um, but before that, just going through a brief overview of uh, sea otters in general, uh, their ecology, and then sort of our next steps. So like I mentioned, I'm going to go pretty brief because I feel like a lot of folks know all of this stuff already, um, but, but just talking about general biology um, and then uh, their ecological role and uh, potential reintroduction and then how you can get involved in the end. Uh, there are, are a few postcards. Please feel free to take this. There's a link here to our website, um, which I'll talk about later. So talking about the taxonomy of sea otters, they uh, are in the Mustelidae family, which is the weasel family. They're actually, sea otters are the largest weasel in the family, but they are the smallest marine mammal. And so uh, there are three types of sea otters, three subspecies. There's the Asian sea otter, the Southern sea otter, and the Northern sea otter. And so talking a little bit about their morphology, uh, the information up here is more specific to Northern sea otters, and that's because that's uh, what I've worked with. <laughs> so Southern sea otters are actually a little bit smaller, but generally speaking for Northern sea otters, they're about four feet long and they can weigh up to hundred pounds. So they're a pretty big animal, even though they look pretty small. Um, so this picture here is of a, a nested uh, adult female up in Alaska. We were doing a mortality study. Uh, we were putting tractors in them, but just to give you sort of a size indicator. So, you know, the German shepherd size or so. Um, you know, sea otters don't have blubber like most marine mammals. And uh, so they need to continuously eat. And then they also have a really uh, dense fur coat. And so that is vital uh, to them keeping warm. The skull is actually a little bit different. Uh, they're made for crushing, and so most of their teeth in the back are flat. So if you were to see a river otter versus a sea otter, the river otter's teeth are more like a cat. They're quite uh, pointed. Um, and so if you ever see a, a skull on the side, uh, that's a good way to tell the difference. But um, yeah, and then of course they are extremely powerful uh, and they have really sensitive paws. Uh, and that is so that they can manipulate a lot of their prey. Uh, they're one of the few animals that use as tools. And then they actually have retractable claws like a cat. Uh, yep. And so in the wild, they do segregate uh, by groups. And so they'll have the mom and pup groups, and then they'll also be the male groups. Um, they do have mating all year round, not like elk, where there's like a rutting season. They do mate and pup year round. And sexual maturity doesn't happen until about three years of age. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the mom or the pup is typically with the mom about six months. And sort of a fun fact is you can actually tell how old the pup is by how buoyant they are in water. <laughs> so there's actually a chart if you see a pup that can't, can't go in the water. It's pretty new uh, versus one that can dive a little bit and it's a little bit older. And so the mom will actually fluff up the otter, the pup, and blow air in. And so the, the pup will sit on top uh, and be pretty buoyant. And their life expectancy is about 15 years. 20 years is, is uh, exceptional. And so this is general species needs. This is extremely general, but um, for the most part, sea otters tend to be in water that's about 100 meters deep. That is because that is about their capacity for diving and foraging, yeah, so about 300 feet. They tend to stay in much shallower water than that, more like 40 meter depths, uh, even 25 meter depths are probably where most of the sea otters occur. They are found in diverse substrates, so anything from sandy bottoms where crabs are to rocky uh, uh, substrates. So rocky substrates are where the sea urchins are. That's where a lot of kelp is. Uh, their primary prey is on benthic invertebrates. So I think they've been uh, their general speeder. So I think they've been classified to eat about 150 different uh, prey items. Um, 
And they do consume, because they don't have blubber, 20 to 30% of their body weight a day. Wow. I was uh, being a little, uh, maybe I was hungry and I had a Reese's peanut butter cup. So I just thought I'd do some calculations and that's about 440 Reese's peanut butter cups a day. Is what <laughs> I, <would eat. laughs> so, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and then, you know, generally speaking again, you know, they do prefer kelp areas, but they don't need it. And so um, what kelp does provide for them is a place to um, put their, their pups in, secure them so they don't float away. Um, and then also uh, kelp also provides protection um, from marine predators. Um, and so again, it's not essential. They do prefer it, but, but it's not essential. So looking at the historical range, um, which is indicated in that sort of bright yellow there, sea otters occurred from Japan all the way down south to uh, Mexico. And then that purple area is their current range. And so although sea otters were widely distributed, um, I think we all understand, you know, commercial harvests led to uh, a, the species almost being extinct at one point. And so in 1911, the Fur Seal Trade Act, I believe, uh, came into play, which then stopped the fur trade. And so of that, there was these 13 isolated populations that are indicated by the stars up there. Uh, and so that was not that many um, sea otters that were left. Um, the photo here on the left is a picture of some skins drying out in the uh, Aleutian chain in 1880. And then, um, so from those remnant populations after 1911, they did start to expand some, and then translocation started happening in the 60s and 70s. And so translocations started from animals in the so in the the Aleutian chain here uh, near Chip uh, Amchika, and they were brought to southeast Alaska, to British Columbia, Vancouver Island, uh, Washington, and Oregon, and also the Pribilofs. So the Pribilof Islands, which is in Alaska, is not. Uh, indicated there, and Oregon is also not indicated on that map, but the other three translocations that were successful are indicated by those black arrows there. Um, and so I will talk about that here in a second. So um, in 1972 is the when the Marine Mammal Protection Act came on, and that's when sea otters received even more protection. So again, the current range um, is that purple there. I'm not gonna go through all of this because it's uh, a little fizzy, but so you have the, the Asian otters over here on the far left, it's kind of the gray box uh, that's in Japan and Russia. And then you have three stocks in Alaska, the red, the green, and the, and the blue here. So it's going from west to east is the Southwest uh, distinct population, which is listed as threatened in the red circle there. You have the South Central stock, and then you have the Southeast stock. And then moving further down the coast, uh, you have Washington uh, and British Columbia and the blue circle. That's also Northern sea otters. Those came from Alaska. And then further down the coast, you have that purple box there, and that is Southern sea otter. So it's a different subspecies. And so there was an isolated population left down there. Um, and so that has been able to uh, essentially stay. Um, the population is, is pretty small, roughly around 3,000 individuals. But what I want to point out here is that there's about a 900 mile stretch along the coast that doesn't have sea otters, that they were historically there. And so that is what our feasibility assessment uh, is looking at is that 900 mile stretch between Washington, where there currently is sea otters, and then Central California. So this is a graphic of the last 10 translocations um, that have occurred. Again, it's pretty busy. I'm going to focus in on Oregon here. 
1970 and 1971, there were three translocation efforts, two of which were at Point Orford, and then one was on Cape Argo. And they brought in from Alaska 93 individuals, uh, and they left them there. There's a number of theories of what happened exactly. The, the problem was there wasn't a lot of monitoring that happened, so we have sort of these blips in time. So in 1974, there was an estimate about 20 left, and then 1981 was the last sighted otter, mm -hmm. and that was at Cape Blanco. Um, so in Oregon right now, you do occasionally have a sea otter come through. Uh, there were two this past year. Last year, I think there were six or seven. Those are all adult males coming down from Washington. And so that population is expanding some, and those males are the ones that tend to go off first. And so since the translocations, I should say in the 70s here, we have learned a ton about uh, husbandry uh, specifically. And so there has been successful translocations since then. Exxon Valdez also brought in uh, a lot of information about sea otter handling too, and so um, we've learned a ton since the 70s, I guess, is my point. So I think we're all very familiar with the, the ecological role that sea otters play, but i um, just going to go through it very briefly. Um, and so Sea otters are considered this keystone species, um, so they have a, a role in the environment and, uh, you know, they can they eat the sea urchins, which are eat, eating the kelp, and so if they can balance that, then the kelp can then get established, and then you have this sort of kelp forest because there is a balance there. Without sea otters uh, or sea stars, the sea urchins can become overpopulated, they graze all of the kelp forests, and so you have these sort of birch and barrens is what they're called. And so with sea otters that are eating the urchins, you'll have a much more diverse um, ecosystem, like here on the left, uh, because of the fin fish, there's a lot of salmon, like juvenile salmon, hide, there's uh, the number of species that use a kelp forest is much greater than something in the urchin barren area. So some of you may have seen this picture. This is from Port Orford. This is from um, uh, ODFW, Oregon Fish, Department of Fish and Wildlife. They recently put out that picture on the on the far right there. Um, and so their recent survey showed that the area was 10,000 times more dense in purple urchins than the survey that they had done in 2014. And so. Um, Again, in the absence of sea otters and sea stars, you'll start seeing areas that are like this. Um, and so sort of these big trophic cascades. Here's another study that uh, was conducted up in British Columbia. And so this was from 2018, looking at the effects of sea otter recovery. And these two photos are within one year of sea otters returning. It's not to say that this is going to be how it goes all the time, because that's not true, but but um, there could be some delayed effects. But generally speaking, when sea otters do return, uh, they provide balance and the, the kelp can then establish. And so um, looking at other studies, the amount of carbon storage that kelp can contain is Pretty amazing. If you look at a per um, acreage of forest per acreage of kelp, kelp can store 20% more times the carbon than forest. And so uh, the study was looking at 20% or 20 times? 20 times. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this was looking at. Um, the comparison between the two of kelp and, and no kelp in these systems. And so uh, with kelp and sea otters, the storage factor was increased by 12%. Um, 
there's also been notes of kelp can uh, help reduce ocean acidification. So they're taking that carbon that's in the water, uh, they're photosynthesizing, and then uh, increasing the pH in and around kelp. So sea otters do have positive impacts um, on kelp beds uh, and seagrass uh, and eelgrass. These kelp beds and, and such do promote uh, species diversity in these big forests. Um, the finfish also are is a positive. And then the kelp, the carbon storage um, factor. So kelp is one of the quickest growing um, species, and so it can grow up to two feet per day. So the amount of storage uh, is pretty incredible. And then overall global biodiversity in these in these forests is pretty huge. <laughs> So last year, uh, we, the Fish and Wildlife Service, was tasked by Congress um, to conduct a feasibility study. So we were specifically mandated to uh, study the feasibility and cost of reestablishing sea otters on the Pacific coast of the continuous US and to report the committee the results of such a study within one year of enactment. So that was, that was provided to us in 20. 21, and we provided the report last year. It was just published on our website, which you can find here. Um, if you, there's some light reading, I think it's roughly 300 pages. <laughs> um, but there's also an executive summary, which I think is about 12 pages. So highlighting, um, but both can be found here. So, so please go online. So our approach, um, the assessment is intended to be read as a companion to the Alaka Alliance's feasibility study. So the Alaka Alliance is a nonprofit in Oregon that's looking at the reintroduction of sea otters to Oregon. And so they came out with a feasibility assessment. They had a number of researchers on that um, uh, board already. And so uh, extremely knowledgeable sea otter folks. And so we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So our document is uh, in part, we, we refer to that document quite a bit, just so that we can redo some of those parts and pieces. It does differ in that we follow the IUCN framework. Um, and so what that means is it's uh, basically asking two questions. So is there a conservation benefit to the species and the ecosystem? And then two, is reintroduction a viable option? And so that is what our assessment is, is, is answering those two questions. And so in doing so, we need to evaluate the feasibility and the risk. But where our document also is a little bit different than the Alaka Alliance is, is that we uh, looked at a bigger geographic footprint. And so we went from Northern California to Oregon. And so um, there's a few things that are a little bit different there. So before I move on to this next power point slide, um, looking at this map here, I'll try to explain it. Um, so these darker lines, so the, the orange here is occupied southern sea otter. And then up here is the dark purple. The occupied uh, northern sea otter up in Washington. And so this oval indicates the 900 mile stretch where there's no sea otters. But the overall graphic here with the colors is to look at genetics. And so Purple is the northern sea otter, and then orange is the southern sea otter. And so what you can see in Alaska, historically, is Oregon is where the mixing pot occurred. So there's a transition zone between northern and southern uh, genes in Oregon. So what's in our assessment? Uh, the background of sea otters, uh, you know, taxonomy, uh, and all of that stuff. 
And then we looked at the goals and objectives of reintroduction. And then the feasibility. Uh, and so that we broke it down into biological, uh, legal, and socioeconomic. And then there's also some um, cost estimates in there as well. And then we looked at the risk assessment. And then made conclusions, uh, recommendations, and next steps. And so what we do not do is we don't take a position on the um, whether or not reintroduction should occur. We just basically say, you know, um, well, I'll tell you what we say, but uh, we're not making a proposal at this time. It's just uh, we're just laying out what needs to be done and uh, how we could potentially uh, increase the likelihood of success. So there were two objectives that we looked at for reintroduction. Um, one is to restore and improve southern sea otters. Um, and then the other is to restore the ecosystem. And so for southern sea otters, to improve southern sea otters, we looked at this big gap. Uh, and we said we could in improve the genetic diversity by filling that in. Uh, we can also contribute to the recovery and delisting of southern sea otters and by increasing the number and range uh, and the genetic diversity. So right now, the southern sea otters are limited in their movement north and south because of white sharks. And so they're getting picked off. So, that, so their, um, their footprint is pretty small. So, um, and then we looked at restoring ecosystem function, uh, ecosystem resiliency. And so what we think is, you know, the sea otters are keystone species. So that's going to help balance the marine ecosystem. The biodiversity part, uh, where you increase biodiversity in these kelp forests. Carbon sequestration, which we talked about a little bit. And then, of course, the resiliency to climate change. And what we were thinking there is more uh, about the shoreline erosion. So, you know, kelp can actually uh, tamper the waves and stuff like that and help with erosion. And then also ocean acidification. So in our feasibility, we determined that there is suitable habitat and there is suitable prey, asterisk. So we need to know or have a better sense on specific uh, sites before we can truly say that. So this is just a generalized statement. There is prey out there and there is habitat, but we need to know more information. There is benefits. Um, to the ecosystem, which we just talked about. And experience from past reintroductions, so this is possible. And so now to the socioeconomic feasibility. And so there's definitely a range of impacts here. We do know that there's going to be negative impacts to commercial shellfish harvest. As as well as recreational and tribal shellfish harvest. And then there's also going to be some regulatory requirements for marine construction projects, and that's because of the MMPA. I think that's going to be pretty small. Um, and then there's also potentially uh, regulatory restrictions on fishing gear and what that means is set nets. Um, and then the potential inability to authorize incidental take in fishery that's specific to southern sea otters. And so there are going to be negative effects on, on shellfish. Uh, what we don't know is the, the scope of that. Uh, and so if it's going to be local um, scale uh, or not. So there are positive um, socioeconomic impacts. Obviously, the ecosystem services for mitigating climate change, the commercial fin fish and recreational fin fish, um, you know, these kelp forests do provide that benefit because that's more habitat. And then ecotourism, recreational diving will also uh, have a positive impact. And then cultural values and traditional significance to tribes. Uh, and then an existence value. Um, what I mean here 
It's just knowing that sea otters exist. <laughs> so that means a lot um, to a number of folks, even if they never see a sea otter. So. So asking, is it legal, uh, legally feasible? And the short answer is yes. Uh, I'm not a, a lawyer, but I will uh, sort of go through this some. So there are really two uh, acts that cover sea otters. And so the Marine Mammal Protection Act and then the Endangered Species Act. But the Endangered Species Act only covers that of Southern sea otters. So for example, if Washington otters were brought into Oregon. That is that is, they are not covered under the ESA, the Endangered Species Act. But under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, there is a take moratorium, which doesn't allow people to hunt or kill sea otters, with the exception up in Alaska, there is subsistence harvest. The other thing. Um, under the MMPA is there's no authorization for incidental take on commercial fisheries in California sea otters. Um, but generally speaking, it is legally feasible to reintroduce sea otters. And so in prepping that um, reintroduction assessment, we want to conduct a number of interviews uh, in California and Washington just to get thoughts and concerns and perspectives, this is by no means comprehensive. Um, this was just sort of a, a wide uh, spread on different views. And some of the things that we heard is that folks want a clear management plan prior to reintroduction. So people want to know what we're planning to do with the otters once they're in the water. That sounds reasonable to me. So um, people want to understand the negative impacts specifically on the shellfish uh, resources. And then also the cumulative impacts on fisheries, including uh, regulatory constraints. There was a lot of thoughts um, on kelp forest restoration uh, and ecosystem resiliency. Um, a number of uh, Thoughts that came up on tourism and economic benefits. And then the existence value came up quite a bit. And the tribes um, within the reintroduction area are typically supportive of the potential of reintroduction. And then the state's views are uh, Oregon was supportive of the study, and California is remaining neutral. So in conclusion, we had to evaluate two things, feasibility and risk. So let's talk about feasibility first. So we concluded it's biologically feasible, um, although there's definitely a number of baseline studies that still need to occur um, to evaluate uh, potential reintroduction sites. We also mentioned the potential for experimental pilot studies uh, that could be helpful. Um, we look at the socioeconomic um, feasibility, and it's also feasible, but recognizing that there's going to be both benefits um, and costs associated with that, and so we are recommending further evaluation there. And then finally, it is legally feasible, um, and there shouldn't be any large legal constraints. So the other thing we were tasked with in this study was coming up with a budget. So uh, there's a plethora um, of examples of potentials, uh, source populations, locations, and such um, in this. And so we got a range of roughly 26 to $43 million, and that's 13 years of uh, work. And what that includes is three years of baseline studies, so before sea otters are even introduced and then 10 years of implementation and monitoring. Um, and again, this is completely a range, uh, and it doesn't include anything that we're um, doing from now until then. This is just a, a rough estimate. <laughs> so the other thing we had to evaluate was risk. And so for 
biological risk, uh, there is risk of inaction. And by that, we mean if we're waiting for natural range expansion for southern sea otters, it's um, unlikely not going to occur because of the shark issue, um, which poses a threat. So if there's a catastrophic event, say an oil spill, um, that can be detrimental to the southern sea otter. The socioeconomic risk is, has the most uncertainty um, with regard to severity and scope. And so with that, uh, we say that further evaluation is needed and uh, we need to sort of hone in on some sites selection to understand uh, what sort of level uh, shellfish resources could be impacted. And then finally, the legal risk, um, which is, is quite low. So is reintroduction a viable conservation uh, option? And we determined, yes, it's feasible. There is significant benefits to the species and the ecosystem, but work is needed to reduce uh, risk and uncertainty. And that is, you know, the socioeconomic impacts is huge. Like we need to figure that out. So what are our next steps? Um, so we are beginning to uh, initiate facilitated structured decision making um, process. And so starting to get stakeholders involved and engaged. We're just starting this process now. Um, we are going to start doing a number of outreach uh, opportunities for the public. We want to understand all voices and concerns um, and start getting a grasp on that. We're also going to develop criteria for selection and evaluation of potential reintroduction sites. Uh, this means getting a group of scientists together to figure out um, what is biologically possible um, and then also logistically possible. And so by that, I mean, you know, you're, if sea otters were reintroduced, you want to make sure that you can be able to monitor them uh, over time. Uh, and if there's any need to recapture or something like that, that is, it's doable. And then also conduct a comprehensive site-specific socioeconomic uh, impact assessment, which is uh, could be needed. So there's there's a uh, laundry list of things that we need to do, um, and from this process, we're hoping then to understand some of the potential reduction options, uh, including slice. And so <laughs> how to get involved. Um, one is to, we do have a Fish and Wildlife website that's specific to sea otter reintroduction, um, which is on here. And then we are trying to set up a listserv. And so there's gonna be a button to check back um, so that when we have updates or something like that, you know, if you sign up for that listserv, you'll get that too. Also attend meetings. So we are going to start doing these listening sessions uh, here in the next few months. Um, we don't have a calendar put together. That's something I'm working on now. But we want to hear all perspectives, all sides, all voices matter. And so um, staying informed and attending these meetings and, and giving us your opinion would be super helpful, just like this cartoon. So um, yeah, we want to hear from you. You can get involved in organizations. Um, and then also, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm Say Martin. Um, the, my supervisor is Michelle Zorchez. We both have the same first name. Uh, and she is the supervisor to the Newport Fish and Wildlife Field Office. But feel free to reach out to us directly too if there's any questions or concerns or, or you just want to talk. So, with that, we'll leave room for questions because I have a feeling there might be some questions. Okay. okay. I wanted to know why there was that price tag between, let's say, 23 to 46 million. I yes. felt it was a, uh, how can you justify that type of uh, 
expand. Yeah, so so that price tag came with sort of um, paint by your paint by uh, get your own adventure, I guess. So there's right. everything from you know one option is you're taking wild sea otters from Washington, bringing them down here, um, which is uh, everything has a cost, and then monitoring them to having surrogate raised sea otters in California that are also brought up here, which has an additional cost. And so that is basically the everything from the veterinary care, the technicians on the ground monitoring, the, the flights, the, um, yeah, all the baseline assessments. Uh, and so it's, it's sort of just the range. It, it's gonna fall somewhere in there. I don't know where. Related to that question, though, I'm, I'm maybe you could give a little more information about the earlier translocation. Uh, I'm imagining that was a smaller ticket item, and how was that done? So I don't fully know the full details. My little understanding is that a boat was brought down from Alaska with a whole bunch of otters in it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, a lot of things have improved since then, uh, and I think you know one one thing I didn't mention I should have mentioned is you know in previous translocations, uh, sea otters are wild animals, so they go where they want, um, and so fifty to ninety percent of them disperse when released. And so that is something that we are thinking about, you know, even though we might pick up a pretty site, you know, that doesn't mean that that otter or otters is, is going to stay there. And so, yeah, so the price tag thing and, and what they did in the 70s, um, I don't think it's something that we would do now. Michelle, is there good data on what the shellfish and crab um, commercial and recreational fisheries in Texas and the Washington and Vancouver area? That is a good question. Yes, there's some. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head, um, but there is some. And I don't think the impact was that much, but um, I need to double check that. Well, I was wondering about the stakeholders slide you showed, and it seemed to me that on the, the stakeholders, uh, most of them, a great deal of them were uh, stakeholders that had a commercial or monetary interest uh, involved. And I see it more that I would like to see an expanded stakeholder slide because I think all of us are stakeholders because we all, if you've shown evidence that there is an effect on climate change and ocean acidification. So we're all stakeholders in climate change and, and the health of the oceans. So it seemed to me that that was very skewed towards uh, economic interests. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And so that was just the socioeconomic perspective. Um, but as far as stakeholder engagement, we are going to have a, a wide breadth of folks and so we are actually going through the process to figure out yeah how many people what's the process um you know um how how do we identify that stakeholder group because like you said there's a lot of folks and so no i think your point is valid yeah. you know there's been a lot of oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, there's been a lot of marine surveys down the coast it seemed to me that there are at least Preliminary sites to show a lot of food source for sea otters, sea urchins. And unless, you know, if not, there's no food, they are going to go somewhere else. But if there are high concentrate areas that have high concentration of sea urchin and other fish or food sources, that would be the number one thing to determine when you start to look at sites. And then hopefully they back to California. Right now you're doing feasibility, but once you get into the doing the studies, is that something that you would be spending time on? And, and shouldn't there already be a lot of data on that? 
Yeah, so uh, can, I, can I reconnect to my PowerPoint actually? Is that okay? To answer your question, um, yes, there's definitely a lot of information that's already out there. Um, and there's also been a paper that was published uh, in 20, um, 2021, I believe, um, by a gentleman called uh, Dominic Cohen. So, um, put it at the end because figured this question might come up. So this is the paper uh, that was recently published and it was looking at um, predicted equilibrium densities for sea otters specifically. And this was looking at a lot of um, habitat characteristics uh, such as depth, um, kelp, uh, distance to shore. Anyway, I can't remember exactly, but there has been some publication. Um, and so, and then, Tim Tinker uh, has also developed for the Alaka Alliance a uh, reintroduction um, model that you can actually go online and look at as well. And it's sort of this general um, sense of some of the habitat characteristics and such. Um, but but as far as um, you know, specific sites, I don't know. That's something that we're still trying to figure out. I mean, this is. Um, you know, something we'll be looking at, but it's not the, the whole gamut. Um, and then, yeah, if there's been recent updates of benthic uh, habitat assessments or anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's more of them, but generally speaking, yeah, they're saying. Yeah. Uh, following up on one of the economic okay, questions, it seems to me, I this may have been in there, I may have missed it, but it seems to me that there was a question of trade-off between the economic value of the kelp that the uh, urchins are eating versus the uh, economic value of the, the urchins that the, the people who want to harvest kelp <laughs> saying, oh, the urchins are eating our, our crop and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, you know how what that trade off looks like as far as um, how much value of kelp is getting destroyed in the process and would be protected by the sea otters? That's a good question. I don't. Um, the other question uh, are the, we, we're showing us certain sort of encircled populations. Are, are those capable of interbreeding or are they separate species? Uh, like up in Alaska and such? It, it, well, if you brought, brought some of the ones that are up in uh, British Columbia or wherever, the ones in Central California. Yeah, they could. Yeah, and I think that would actually be beneficial. So because of the fur trade and not the local, genetics, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. down so low, yeah. So two questions, just touching on your uh, statement about the kelp. I would imagine, I would imagine the commercial takers don't want kelp. Mm -hmm. It gets in the way of their hearts. So, mm -hmm. but of course, over time, biodiversity will balance that. Well, the second question is, is the, uh, your technology, uh, current technology adequate for you to be able to track the others? Have you got that in place? Yeah. Um... So the first part is, I don't know on the kelp, but uh, that's, that makes sense. Um, the technology on sea otters. So sea otters are like monkeys. They can reach their entire body. So that makes it hard to put a tag on, for instance. And so USGS, our counterparts down in California, are actually working with uh, NASA to develop a tag that uh, clips on the flipper. 
um, that you are able to then get GPS locations on. Uh, we have successfully put in like VHF tags that are internal uh, that have been, worked really well for years and years and years. Um, and then, but yeah, eventually anything that's on the external part of a sea otter, it's going to come on. <laughs> so then you can track that external just by uh, certain spray running across it. Yeah. yeah. To the depth of it. Yeah. And so, yeah. And even the internal uh, antennas too work pretty well, mm -hmm. even for flights and stuff. Yeah. You can pick them up. Yeah. I don't know whether you, whether anybody was successfully tagging them at the time, but the sea otters that were introduced to Oregon, did they, did, they, did, they, did they die out or did they go back to where they've been captured? Or does anybody know? I think the theory is maybe a little of both. Uh, I think some of them, you know, maybe have tried, just went back to uh, Alaska and went north and maybe joined up with the other otters in Washington. I think generally folks don't know, but that is a theory. Um, and, then, and then also, yeah, I think they, at some point. Uh, well, a similar question. We know that it's one subspecies to the north and one subspecies to the south. And does anybody know where the two subspecies met? And, and is, it, is there a conceivable possibility that there was yet a third subspecies of Oregon, which was completely driven to extinction? Yeah, so I think uh, based on um, archaeological digs and finding the sea otter uh, parts, Oregon was the melting pot between uh, southern sea otters and northern sea otters. Uh, and so that was where the mixing occurred. Um, I don't think that there is another subspecies that we're unaware of. I mean, I guess it's possible, but I don't think I don't think so. Is there any evidence of interbreeding between the two of Oregon then? Yep. 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 It's possible. Yep. Is the California area the only location that the southern sea otter in the world? First question. And then second question is draw comparison if you would the uh, size of the population of the northern sea otter versus the mm -hmm. southern. Good, good questions. So, yes, uh, the southern sea otter only occurs in California. Southern sea otter population is roughly 3,000, uh, the northern sea otter population. In Southeast Alaska alone is roughly 20,000. Um, in Washington, it's roughly 3,000. I don't know what British Columbia is. Um, I should know in the other parts of Alaska, uh, but it's quite large. Yeah. Um, what is the notion of how, how many sea otters, if, if we got some bloody and of how, how many would be brought in, and then there's a tar target population of what they might uh, grow to, ideally? Yeah, so that is a great question. That is something we don't have an answer to. I, you know, historically, they're bringing in 20 to 100 otters. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if that makes sense or not. You know, I, I don't. I will point out, um, so, you know, Talking about Southwest Alaska, yeah. when that population, uh, when they reintroduced waters there, that population sort of boomed quite a bit. A large part of it, uh, if you look at the um, the landscape of Southeast Alaska, it's a lot of fjords, it's a lot of protected bays. It is, um, for instance, uh, this is Glacier Bay, which has one of the highest densities of sea otters. Uh, you can see it has these nice fingers. Sea otters can go north, south, east, west. And so the carrying capacity, um, you know, it is like, this is great habitat and sea otters can go anywhere. So you look at Southeast Alaska, and then you look at the coast of Oregon, and it's dramatically different. And so the, the population size, in Oregon will never get to be anything near Southeast Alaska. I mean, the habitat is not there. Um, I should have put down here like the, the just the bathymetry comparison alone. I mean, Oregon is much less. So the curing capacity in that paper that I pointed out, the Dom Kone, there is some um, number that's given in there. I, I don't actually remember off the top of my head, but 
generally speaking, we're, we're talking small numbers in Oregon. Yeah, you may have touched on this, but I don't remember this. I, I don't think you went very deep. What else do sea otters eat? Uh, the, uh, if clams, if there, yeah. mussels, oh. uh, octopus. I've seen, um, yeah, uh, abalone. Yeah, abalone. Yeah. So that is definitely a concern here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've seen me some flatfish. Uh, that's pretty unusual. Basically, in vertebrates, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've, yeah, like I said, they've been documented 150 different species of things. So, yeah. Well, there are different species north and south here of the abalones and it's, it's something of a gap along Oregon we just don't have abalones here and then similarly but, uh, with, the, with the urchins they're, they're quite rare here even though it's the same, generally the same species of strongulus and protus that uh, occur both north and south of here is, uh, is that possibly a, a, a determinant of where the, urchin, where the uh, otters occur or did occur that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. What? So where? How far apart are they? By the way, those. What? Which? Well, there, there are so, so different species north and south of abalones. Mm -hmm. right. And generally, those in the the San Juan Islands, for instance, tend to be smaller individuals than those found in California. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. So in trying to get this plan established, I'm thinking about the fact that there were all these meetings before the marine reserves were put in. Is that maybe part of the plan to have meetings all along the coast to talk to citizens and fishermen and everybody? Yeah, and so, get their ideas. Yep. So that is the next steps are are setting up these meetings up and down the coast and in Northern California to start hearing people out. Yeah. Yeah. What are their values? What are their concerns? Um, yeah. How do they feel? So I think we have a lot to learn for sure. You kind of free your timeline, and uh, two questions. Who makes the final decision or how does that get made? And is three years um, given some of our other endangered species experience really realistic? Mm -hmm. um, the timeline to get a decision. Yeah, so um, the three years, the baseline, that's just the baseline assessment. That's like once if we go forward with reintroductions, like full on studying those sites. And so prior to that, there's a lot that has to happen. So there's these, you know, information gathering, there's the stakeholder meetings, there's the um, scientists identifying potential reintroduction sites, and then there's a the large socioeconomic impact assessment. And so we have to go through all of that um, and then, then we come up with, is there a proposal? Is there a proposal to bring in reintroduction uh, or not? And so if the answer is yes, then there's a NEPA process. And so that NEPA process then triggers all of this other uh, stuff. So what we're estimating as a timeline, three to five years for the process. So, is it, is it possible to go ahead and California to go on? That comes up. <laughs> <laughs> it does come up, and, I, and the, the short answer is no. And so we are actually working very closely with them. And Would it be possible just to really put the order on yeah. rather than California? Is that another scenario that you have? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if that's possible because it's. Um, 
the whole uh, thought for this reintroduction is it benefits the southern sea otter, which occurs in California. And so um, we're working very closely. Uh, it's near. Well, so. <laughs> it's a smaller area to work with, but it's your cost, right? If you still have the migration. Mm -hmm. Washington, so you have a number yeah. of scenarios, obviously. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's a number, yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, I don't know, the, the, the decision making is going to be at the agency level or congressional input on it or on the booth who gets to decide. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't answer your question. Uh, yes, so ultimately it's Fish and Wildlife's decision uh, as to whether or not to reintroduce. Based on the process, the NEPA, and it's all, uh, you know, public hearings and such. So, how? What's the connection with the Alliance in this regard? Yeah. So the Alliance Alliance is the the nonprofit uh, here that's uh, wanting to reintroduce uh, sea otters. And so they are doing a lot of uh, education and outreach. Uh, about this. They provide their own feasibility assessments um, and then they um, are uh, answering a lot of our scientific questions too. Um, you know, one, for example, of the six or seven otters that stranded in 2021, 60% uh, of those had shark bite and that was here in Oregon. And so we want to understand what is the, the predation um, right up here in Oregon, you know, we're going to have a lot and a little. Um, and so the Alliance Alliance is, is helping fund that study. And so, um, is there a possibility that they could go ahead with reintroduction without you? Uh, yeah, unfortunately not. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. If they wanted to, they could swim down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As a general question, uh, you are, uh, are they a species that can meet with the uh, sea otters or are they completely separate species? And uh, that is a big they question. Do they do go in the salt water, yeah. And so, um, in, in thinking about the interactions in Alaska, river otters tend to be actually. What I've seen is uh, more aggressive than sea otters um, and like kicking them off the docks and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, they eat different things. I, I don't, they might be able to breed together. I, I don't, yeah, I don't and know. Is there a river otter, uh, otter population? Yeah, yes. there is. Yeah. There are different genera, aren't there? We've seen them. Yeah. Maybe. I think they are. Okay. So they're just different species. Okay. Most of the time, we do reports of sea otters. First time I saw a sea otter in the world, or a river otter, I was excited. <laughs> sea otters are here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, they were just out there playing around. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Since its beginning, the uh, Oregon Coast Aquarium has had sea otters on display right now. I don't know how long it's had populations from both the north and south subspecies. Have you been able to learn anything of what you can apply from the maintenance of those sea otters? Yeah, that is a great question. So they, they did have one northern sea otter who unfortunately just passed. Right. Um, and so they still have three southern sea otters uh, there. Um, as far as learning opportunities, um, I think that's something that we're trying to um, sort of explore right now uh, is what, what can we learn from these individuals? Um, so more to come on that. Do you know if the ones that were originally trapped here were more predominantly northern or south? The ones that were translocated oh, or no. the, okay. the, the fur breeders like that? Oh, uh, I, I think based on the genetics, it was sort of a, a, a mix of the two. Yeah. So yeah. There wasn't one that was more than one of it. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. 
Do I have a, a handle on what the population density was before the fur trading market? I, I just keep wondering, maybe the sharks alone are keeping it down. And the lack of uh, rocky downtown forest. It was not a good habitat. So I just wondered what it was before we blame the fur traders on the metal density. Yeah. I don't know. And I don't know how good the records were um, for understanding density in some of these areas. I mean, sea otters tend to, depending on the benthic um, or a substrate, you know, they tend to be in lower densities on the, the sandy bottoms versus a higher density in the, um, the, the rocky bottoms where the kelp is. Um, I don't know if there's good enough records to go back to say what it looked like before. That's a good question. Hmm. Is there any concern about the wolves now eating sea otters? Yeah. Uh, I think the short answer is no. Um, we saw that on the Alaska Peninsula too. Um, and so, uh, it, yeah, there seems to be a, a number of sea otters in that area. They're not affecting the 20,000. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think. But yeah, there's also been um, in uh, Katmai area, there's been documentations of bears actually going into the water and, and taking sea otters out too. So it's pretty interesting uh, camera footage. Mm -hmm. Do orcas prey on them as well? Yeah, so that has been the theory uh, for why the southern sea otter or southwest population in Alaska uh, went down was because of orca predation. Yeah. yeah. Well, stay tuned. I'm sure I'll be back and I'll have more answers for you all. <laughs> so, thank you. We hope you'll be back with good news. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, yeah.